welcome to our next segment. Um, we're making progress. We're right at mid to late 19th century. Um, we're going to be looking at photography and the movement of realism in this period. Um, we'll be looking at photography, printmaking, as well as some painting. So we're going to begin our lecture by just talking about photography. Um, this was a phenomenal discovery in the mid-1800s. Um, and when you, we think of photography today, and I know some of you have taken my um, Photo One class, um, by modern standards, when we start to look at some of the images made during the 19th century, um, they can appear very primitive. Um, and, you know, obviously, um, the the technology is different than than the digital um, technology they, that we have today. Um, you see lots of very stark black and white landscapes. You know, people um, aren't usually smiling, um, and you know a lot of that has to do with slow shutter speeds. You know, um, very primitive lenses that were being developed during this time. Um, but it's important because photography is important because it really did challenge our notions of um, what de what defines works of art, um, and it became a very controversial fine art medium simply because it's difficult to classify um, photography, um, mainly because some people want to question whether it's an art or is it a science. Nineteenth-century photographers struggled with this distinction, um, trying to reconcile aesthetics with improvements in the technology. So, although the principles of cameras were known in antiquity, um, the actual chemistry needed to register an image was not available until the nineteenth century. Um, artists from the Renaissance onwards used a camera obscura, Latin for dark chamber, or a small hole in a wall of a darkened box that would pass light through the hole and project an upside down image of whatever was outside the box. We saw some of these um, uh, early Renaissance artists using this device um, in, in a lot of ways to uh, uh, transfer an image and to express these ideas of um, perspective and depth. Um, so what really, um, in the 19th century, this idea of capturing an image and uh, onto a substrate or some surface was really the um, important breakthrough. So it wasn't until um, the invention of a light-sensitive surface by a Frenchman named Joseph um, Nipis um, that the basic principle of photography was born. From this point, the development of a uh, photography largely related to the technological improvements in three areas, speed, resolution, and permanence. Um, the first photographs, such as um, Nipis's um, famous view from the window at Graz, um, required a very slow um, shutter speed or very long exposure period. Um, in this case, it, the photographer had to have the camera on this subject with the shutter open for about eight hours. So that's really incredibly a long time. Obviously, um, this really made photographing certain subjects very difficult, but not impossible. Um, so, so with this um, image, um, we're looking, um, Nipis um, used a camera obscura to expose a copper plate coated in silver and pewter. Um, you can see that it's a view um, where he looks out of an upstairs window, and part of the blurry quality is due to the changing conditions during the long exposure time, causing this sort of soft res resolution and less clarity um, of the image. Um, and unfortunately, many of Nipis's earlier images um, simply turned black over time due to the continued exposure to light. Um, this problem was largely solved in 1839 by the invention of hypo, a chemical that reversed the light sensitivity of paper. So photographers after Nipis experimented with a variety of techniques. Louis um, Daguerre invented a new pro process he dubbed the daguerreotype in 1839, which significantly reduced exposure times and created a lasting result 
um, but only produced a single image, and he would actually coat his images on a, a, a silver substrate. Um, at the same time, um, an Englishman, William Henry Fox Talbot, was experimenting with what would eventually become the calotype method, and this would eventually be patented in February 1841. Talbot's innovations included the creation of a paper negative, a new technology that involved the transformation of the negative into a positive image, allowing for more than one copy of the picture to be made. Um, the remarkable detail of Talbot's method can be seen in his famous um, photograph, The Open Door, which you see here, which cap captured the view through um, this sort of medieval looking um, doorway. Uh, and really what people loved about photography was the textures and um, sort of these rough surfaces that, um, that the camera was able to capture. Um, other methods followed. The collodion method was introduced in 1851. This process involved fixing a substance known as gun cotton onto a a glass plate allowing for even shorter exposure times, three to five minutes, which I know from our standards today is, is, is still very, very slow. Um, and, and it also helped make the image more clear and more contrastier. Um, the big disadvantage of um, making um, these images, again, was um, that the collodion process um, needed to be exposed and developed while the chemical coating was still wet. So this meant that photographers had to carry a portable darkroom to develop images immediately after um, their exposure. So, you know, photography during this period was quite cumbersome, and it really took a lot of equipment and effort to, to come away with um, an image. We're going to focus on Daguerre's image um, that he took of his studio um, in 1837. So you can see that these images or these types of images um, are inspired by painted still lifes, very much like the Venatus paintings that we looked at um, from the Baroque period. Um, again, note the variety of textures that he included in his still life. Um, we see fabric, wicker, plaster. We see a framed print metal, wood, and so on. And so what's important about photography is this idea of art referencing art. And now we have a new art form inspired um, um, by older art forms. Um, the daguerreotype had a very shiny surface, um, and it also had very great detail. I'll try to bring in some examples of some daguerreotypes during class um, um, on Friday. Um, photography was often thought of as mechanical, um, and so photographers um, wanted their photos to look like paintings. So as a result, um, painters were often threatened by this new medium of photography. So this whole debate of whether photography could be considered an art um, started to develop. So in terms of subject matter, people also started having their portraits done um, with the daguerreotype. And just to show you how long these exposures were, um, this is somebody getting their portrait done. And there actually was this device that actually had would hold the person's head still. Um, because remember, with um, long exposures, um, if something moves in front of the camera, it, it causes a blurred motion. Um, and so often when you look at daguerreotypes, that's why people look very unhappy because they have to kind of remain stiff um, and frozen. You know, they're not smiling because it would be hard to hold a smile for, you know, eight to ten minutes, which is usually what the exposure time required. And then also this sort of uncomfortableness of having, you know, their head in this contraption. But I thought y'all would get a kick out of seeing that. So both the difficulties of the method of photography and the uncertain um, the uncertainty of the status of photography, again, a lot of painters um, were threatened by this new medium and didn't really think photography should be considered an art form, um, was lampooned by Henri Doimer and, um, and this um, lithograph he did called Not Air, Elevating Photography to the Height of Art in 1862. So Dromer was, um, was French, and he was a French printmaker, caricaturist. He also painted. He was a sculptor. 
Um, and many of his works offer commentary on social and political life in France during the 19th century. So um, Nader was a famous photographer who was really um, no, well known for taking these um, aerial photos of Paris um, beginning in 1858. Um, Doimer presents Nadar as a sort of a quacky photographer um, in this lithograph image he created. In his excitement um, to get a daring shot, he almost falls out of the balloon and loses his hat. So obviously the difficulties in developing a glass negative and some of these other constraints that involved um, in the processes of um, trying to come away with a, um, uh, an image must have been very difficult for Nadar. Um, and, but Tuamir is also making fun of him too. You know, every building has the word um, photographia and, you know, on it. And, um, and what um, Damer is doing is he's mocking the claim that photography can be considered a high art. And so you also see the irony there um, with Nadar in this, you know, hot air balloon um, and in the title of, um, you know, Nadar raising photography to the height of art. Ha ha ha. So um, this illustration was made after a court decision in 1862 that determined that photographs could be considered works of art. Further advances in technology continued to make photography less labor-intensive. By 1867, a dry glass plate was invented, reducing the inconvenience of wet colonial method. Prepared glass plates could then be purchased, eliminating the need to fool with chemicals. In 1878, new advances decreased exposure times to 1 25th of a second, allowing, the, allowing moving objects to be photographed um, and lessening the need for a tripod. Um, this new development is celebrated in Edward Moybridge's sequence called um, Galloping Horse in 1878. Um, he created this image. Um, it was designed to settle the question of whether or not a horse um, ever takes all four legs completely off the ground during um, a gallop. Um, and so the series, the series of photographs um, also demonstrates the new photographic methods that were capable of this sort of um, nearly instantaneous exposure or this sort of stop action um, motion. Um, and so what's important is that photography allowed us to see things that the human eye could not break down, especially these sort of quick actions. Um, and in particular, this debate over the gait and the trot and gallop of a horse. Um, at the time, most artists were, had painted a horse at a trot with one foot always on the ground and at full gallop with the front legs extended forward and the hind legs extended to the rear and all feet and all feet off the ground. So um, really, people wanted to just know if this was really true and this is really how a horse um, really operated in, in real motion. So between 1878 and 1884, um, Moybridge perfected his method um, and, and really did prove that, um, in fact, um, all four hooves um, of a horse do move off the ground during their running stride. So you can see that here. Um, so now we see that photography is advanced enough to capture movements that the human eye cannot. Um, the camera snaps photos at evenly spaced points along a track, giving the effect of things happening in sequence. Um, these motion studies that Moybridge created um, become a gap between this idea of still photography and then um, what eventually will be film and movies. Um, Moybridge used a device called a zopraxiscope, um, which was this arrangement of 12 different cameras um, to create his images. And you can read more about it in the lecture notes. Um, finally, in 1888, George Eastman developed the dry gelatin roll film. This is a sort of 35 millimeter film that your parents and your grandparents use to take pictures. Um, and you can read more about that as well in the lecture notes. I'm not going to go too far into it. And then obviously, Right now, most people shoot digital, and there is no need for film or chemicals or white sensitivity paper or anything like that. It's completely different. 
So, and here are some examples of some of other Moy Bridges um, motion studies. Um, I think they're kind of fun to look at. I want to return back to um, Duamere, um, the printmaker that we looked at earlier, um, because um, printmaking also, I think, becomes very influential in, in art as well. And, and photography and printmaking um, become very influential, in, in particular with newspapers and, and, and reporting the news. So lithography um, is a form of printmaking. Um, lithos is Greek meaning stone and um, graphene meaning to write. And so it's a method of printing originally based on um, this idea of um, drawing on or putting or drawing oil um, on a stone and um, using water. And um, it was invented by in 1796 by um, a German as a cheap way or cheap method of publishing um, theater um, works. Um, and then eventually it was adopted and can be used to print text or artwork onto paper and other suitable materials. Um, and, and what's important again was this was another method of printmaking that allowed for mass production. Mass production. Um, and again, the technique was this idea of printing it from a stone um, or a metal plate with a smooth surface that would you would draw on with oil. And um, so this is a litho lithograph by Duamere, and um, and this really does become the way that newspapers start to show imagery. Um, and this is something new as a way to sort of spice up the story. So when we look at um, this image, we see that there is a specific date, there's a specific location mentioned. Um, and the idea is that this image is like news reportage, por portage, um, and this was a device to suggest an eyewitness um, news reporter. And again, if you want to, for some of my um, studio artists, if you want to learn more about the technique of lithography, there are some YouTube videos that you could watch. Um, it really is beautiful, and a lot of um, contemporary artists start to, to use it as well. Um, this image by um, Duamir is probably one of the grimmest scenes that he ever drew. Obviously, when we look at the sort of parody he did on the photographer Nadar, um, it commemorates the assassination by the National Guard of innocent citizens during an uprising in Paris in 1834, when the army um, repressed um, the silk workers' revolt in Lyon. Uh, this sort of unrest spread in the working class districts in the capital. In response to gunshots from top floor windows, a number at number 12 Rue um, Transnonen, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, but that's the, the street name of where this um, incident occurred, troops stormed the building and opened fire, killing and wounding residents. Um, so some, some things to think about in terms of the composition and this idea of photography influencing other art forms. We look at the picture and we see that the viewer's gaze is immediately drawn to the center of the painting. Here, I'll go back. Um, a lot of it has to do with this contrast of light and dark. Um, and here's a close up too. And it, it really is, this is a good way to it. You can really see how this method really has this sort of where an artist could actually draw. You know, you don't have to etch into a surface and um, it really had this more, it allowed um, artists to be more fluid in their mark making. Um, and we're confronted with what appears when we look at this composition to be a straightforward image of a man in night clothes, but then um, we notice that in fact he's sort of tangled up in this bed linen. Um, although it's not immediately apparent, the dead man, the dead man um, is lying on top of a dead baby, and it looks like her or its head is, is split open. So it's a pretty gruesome image. The two bodies that lie on either side of the picture complement each other, while the bed um, fills up the rest of the composition. Since the bed symbolizes rest and tranquility, its presence both detracts from the horror by neutralizing it um, and adds to it by placing the massacre within this um, common place. So um, there's a lot of interesting sort of metaphors and symbolism going on here. 
And Duomer really thinks about the use of space. Um, the foreground is um, dominated by um, really a blank space. It's almost as if the viewer were on the threshold of the room. So it's almost like we're there, and he's giving us that perspective. Uh, as a horrifying as a scene is with a dead man, dead man lying directly over a baby, one feels more horror at the things that can't be seen. Um, in, in the sense, these figures sort of lying off in the shadows, that and, and these sort of details really draw the viewer in. The stark black um, of the image that um, warns of what's underneath the bed, um, the retreat into the shadows um, in the corners of the room really create this sort of ominous tone. Um, and this lithograph is very distinct from many of other um, Duamere's lithographs because its calm strokes denote this idea of stillness. The central figure does not look dead but almost peacefully at rest, an image reinforced by the fact that the whiteness of the bedsheet covers him um, as well as his white nightshirt and cap. Um, the longer we stay with the stillness of the painting, um, the more our minds overreact to, the, to compensate for such uh, a neat matter-of-fact representation of these horrors. The bed provides the illusion of tranquility when in fact there is none. And so some other things to think about too is that we really start to see how ph photography is influencing other art forms. Notice how um, Duamer is you know, using this sort of awkward cropping where he's cutting off the figures, um, this you know, really awkward foreshortening of the figure. Um, and, and again, it's, it's, a, it's a drawing, it's a painting that's been you know, transferred into a, a lithograph. Um, but the composition and the figures aren't posed in these very high art ways. Um, it's very unposed. And it really does look like a crime scene photo. And so Duamer is very effective because he makes us believe that this picture is reportage, that um, even though he was never at the scene, um, by using these sort of photography-like compositional devices, um, he really makes us, the viewer, think that he was there. And so this image becomes a very powerful image of social awareness and things going on. Um, you know, in civilization and sort of the injustices that might be happening. I'm going to stop here. Um, there will be a part two, and part two will be looking at painting in particular with this idea of realism. So stay tuned. Um, as usual, try to look at the Khan Academy videos associated um, with these lectures when you can.